This is a production of WGBH2 Boston. Finally, Judgment Day in First in the Nation, New Hampshire. We're still live from Manchester, and tonight on Greater Boston, it's all primary all the time. Emily Rudy, Adam Riley, and Marjorie Egan have been talking to voters, and they're turning out big time. Tonight, the three will talk to me. ABC's George Stephanopoulos stopped by to discuss Trump's future and missteps on the Democrat side. Former Republican New Hampshire Governor John Sununu, wait till you hear him on Donald Trump, hide the children. And our caucus weighs in once again. Kogi Roberts, Michael Steele, Bill Crystal, Chris Matthews, and Mike Barnacle on Clinton and the ties that bind Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. It's a wild scene here in the lobby of the Radisson Hotel in Manchester. Of course, we did Boston Public Radio from here earlier today. We've since transformed the studio into TV mode. But come 8 p.m., we'll be back on 89.7 with special election coverage, gone live till the whole thing's done. For now, decision day is coming to an end. Most of the polls here have just closed, with a handful open for another hour. Right next door to us, a room over, the Rubio campaign is set up. Clinton, Bush, and Trump are just blocks away. The others, a city or two beyond, except for Ben Carson, who's skipping his primary night party, not for laundry, but South Carolina. So what are the real deciders saying about it all? Emily Rooney and Adam Riley set out to find out. Usually, turnout in Manchester's inner city Ward 3 is on the low side, but not today. We have been nonstop. It's, it's good. Yay, New Hampshire. And around lunchtime, the biggest beneficiary seemed to be Bernie Sanders. I think he's got the best chance of affecting real change. Anyone who wants to go to college, I feel like, is, is backing Sanders. He beats the Republican candidates by more points than Hillary does, right? That said, Hillary Clinton had her supporters, too. I think she's qualified, ready to go. She gets things done. We also found a Jeb Bush backer. We really need a good, solid leader. And even a Jim Gilmore guy. I called his campaign. He was the only one who personally answered his phone call. But despite this man's best efforts, no one said they had voted for Donald Trump. I just don't like his sass. Which is a bit odd, given Trump's huge advantage in the polls. Emily, what did you see up north? Adam, things were busy up north, too. The city of Laconia, best known for its summer motorcycle festival, was a mix. Some shops were closed for Election Day, others open. There were a lot of people out and about, but none more so than in Ward 6, the Levitt Park Clubhouse polling place. By 11 a.m., 469 of 2,000 eligible voters had already cast their votes. And under new state election law, a lot of people were registering on the spot. But of course, what we wanted to know is, who are you voting for? We got a smorgasbord of responses. Democrat or Republican? Democrat. Who? Hillary. As long as I don't have to explain it. No, you don't have to explain it. Rubio. Uh, Jeb Bush. I'm going to vote for John Kasich. I'm going to be writing in Hillary. In the 45 minutes or so we were there, though, one name was conspicuously absent. Donald Trump? No. Trump? No. 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 But finally... Trump all the way. Bingo. Fox News mistakenly reported earlier today that Trump had won the race, but some polls are still open. People are still voting, and a winner is yet to be declared. Adam and Emily are here, along with Marjorie. Good to see you guys again. You know, I hate the expectations game, but let's play it anyway, if that's okay. <laughs> so Rubio's third out there in Iowa. He's the winner. Uh, Trump and Sanders have double-digit leads. So if they win by single digits, are we going to have to listen, Adam, to people saying, all oh, the second-place finishers, the triumphant one? Uh, we would, and I think in the case of Trump, it would be fair. I was looking back at Real Clear Politics. The last 37 polls, Trump has led by double digits. So if he wins by single digits, that's a big deal. He's and never it, run an election in his life. Le- the last 37 polls, Jim, he's been totally dominant, untouchable. So I think if he wins by eight, it's very, very fair to cast the second place from sure as a winner. Bernie Sanders was up by single digits in a couple polls in the past week. So the Clinton people are really, really good at spinning this. They were already trying to depress expectations. But be careful with that. Emily, a, a year ago, Hillary Clinton was 56 points yeah. ahead in this state. Any victory by Sanders, a win is a win, she no? She's going to be extremely disappointed if she doesn't do much better than the polls had indicated go, leading up until today. I mean, I think she would be happy if she had a single-digit lead, but 
she's going to be disappointed. They're already talking about completely shaking up her campaign. And there was a picture out today. They had they were setting up, and they had the American flags on the Lying floor. On the and floor. Made, they are usually meticulous with detail. That was a bad mistake. So is a win not a win, no matter what the no, margins are? No, I think sometimes we in the media obsess over these things. And if you're the average person, you're looking at this. Somebody won. Somebody came in second. Somebody came in third. So I, I think maybe we overestimate a the nitpicking that the general public does the way we do the general. You know, let's move. On. You know, before we move on, I, did, I heard you had a close <laughs> encounter of a presidential kind today. Quickly, what happened? I did. Well, there's this very attractive gentleman walking around oh. our newsroom, and he was saying what nice people we all were, and he was shaking hands with everybody. And he came over to me, and he said hi, and I said hi, I'm Emily Rooney, WGBH, and I said, who are you? And who was he? It is Jim Gilmore oh, from Virginia. <laughs> okay, here's another thing I hate. I hate I the expression. Too. Who's going to get a ticket to South Carolina and Nevada? I hate that whole thing. Having said that, let's do Who's it anyway. Get a ticket? Here's the real clear <laughs> politics average on the Democratic side. Let's put that up. These are the final polls. But obviously, both Democrats are going to. Let's go to the Republicans now for uh, a second. You know, Adam, the feeling was it's 7.59 Saturday night. If Rubio comes in a strong second, yep. the whole field's consolidated. Right. But with that potential collapse, we don't know if it's going to happen because of the debate performance. Mm -hmm. Does everything change and virtually everybody goes to the next round? I feel like I'm Unless Christie or uh, Carly Fiorina really surprised here in New Hampshire. They go home? They, I, I think they're uh, right on the verge of it. Ben Carson is running kind of a zombie campaign yeah. at this point. I don't even count him being in South Carolina, even though he's there tonight, because he's just this weirdo. So I would say keep an eye on Christie, Fiorina, and also Bush. Bush was talking a lot in his surrogates about overperforming. He's got a ton of dough. He he's not going to go home with all that yeah, money. But, you know, I don't think he even wants to be doing this. So. You know Tickets. What? Jeb Bush is not going to drop out of this race. I think he thinks once he gets passed tonight, he, he's going to do better. He may be right. The other people I agree with you on, Fiorina and, and Ben Carson, doesn't matter. I think Chris Christie is going to be extremely disappointed. He talked about, you know, having gum on his shoes in New Hampshire. He was going to stick here and stick but it doesn't appear. You know, the either. irony is, if it turns out Rubio falls, it's because of Chris Christie. Yeah. And Chris Christie, at least in the polls, has accrued no benefit from his performance no, tonight. No. So how about you? Well, if Christie does not do well, and he's not expected to do that well, I, I hope he does get out, because this is much more his electorate. I mean, this is one state over from Massachusetts. Charlie Baker gave an endorsement, which may not matter much, but it might matter a little. So he doesn't Southern do part well. of the state, yeah. Yes, yeah, so if he doesn't do well here, I think he should get out. You know why I want him to get out and see Arena and uh, Carson, sort of a big upset. We need fewer people on the stage in these in these Republican debates, so you can really get a sense yeah. of, of the candidates. No one's talking about Cruz yet. Well, you know, That's it's interesting. Point. The star <laughs> in Iowa, and it's, he's yeah. still in the mix for number two. Yeah. But I think the feeling is he's really waiting for Super Tuesday, yeah. which I can't stand. They now call the SEC yeah. primary, which includes <laughs> Massachusetts and I think yeah. Vermont. But that's why we're not talking about yeah. it, right? Yeah, well, I mean, he was the Iowa winner, but low expectations but here. So we talked about uh, Jesus and God and faith all the time they in Iowa. Do. Yeah, but this is a state where, you know, that doesn't resonate with a lot of people. This is not a very religious state. He's still state. in the mix for number but two. But then you go he's to South Carolina, different. people are going to love that. They're so. going to love that. So this is like his little hiatus, I think. Do you hate the expression, who's going to get a ticket as much as I do? I want to be clear. <laughs> what is one other one? Run the, I've run never the heard ticket. It What's the expression? I don't know you, what the other you run is. the ticket, you run the shoot, you run yeah, something. Someone yeah. to throw one more thing know. on for size here. Before we left town, before we left Boston, I was complaining virtually every night about New Hampshire's status in this whole thing. Yeah. Governor Sununu is going to be with me for a minute, tried to school me on it today. But the guy who really did it eloquently, listen to what Chris Matthews had to say to me. I think it was just yesterday. Listen. The great thing about it is that people in, in New Hampshire are citizens first, and politicians are political partisans second. And I mean that. They, like my parents, our parents, they went to vote. They believed in voting like going to church every Sunday. I think live for your die means something to me. So, Adam, we've been here a week, and it's been a wild week, I should say. Do they deserve number one status? You know, I don't always agree with Chris Matthews. I think he's dead on. This is a treasured civic ritual. These people go to all these events. Sometimes they're kind of boring. Sometimes they're not. They agonize about who to vote for, and then they turn out in huge numbers. If you move it away from New Hampshire, I'm not sure you can recreate that anymore. How about you, Emily? Jim, you and I have been kind of cynical about this over the years. We've said, oh, who cares what they think anyway? Let's move on. Let's get rid of this first-in-the-nation thing. I agree with Chris Matthews and Adam. I said... 
they've earned the right. I, I'm just so impressed. I joked the other night about that the guy who was the felon told me, oh, I'd like to vote, but I can't because I'm a felon. Everybody wants to vote. Everybody's part of the civic. You're going to make it unanimous? Let me be selfish here. We drove an hour up from Boston. We've got the sleep number bed. You've been ordering <laughs> breakfast in bed. You've got the nice oatmeal. We're getting lunches. We have a wonderful time. You walk down Elm Street, go get great coffee, great food. I want to be back here in 2020. We're not going to go to South Carolina, Jim. This is it. You know, so you two are talking citizenship. So is Chris Matthews. <laughs> She's talking sleep number bed. Exactly. She makes a good point, though. I mean, the <laughs> oatmeal's great. It's right? Adam Riley, you'll be at a campaign headquarters tonight. Which one? I will be at uh, Donald Trump. Don oh, Donald oh, Trump. Oh, and wow. Emily, I'm gonna be right Marjorie, here and I we'll are going to be all doing results starting at 8 o'clock. Great to see you all. Thanks Absolutely. so much. You know, last night I had the chance to catch up with ABC News anchor George Stephanopoulos, and I began by asking George whether we are seeing a ceiling in Donald Trump's poll numbers. He seemed to peak out at what? At the, his biggest polling numbers here were about 34, 35 mm -hmm. at some point. He seems to be closer coming into the vote uh, today, more around 30, 31, perhaps. I guess we're going to find out and tomorrow. A lot of that will depend on, you know, the independents here. Do they decide to, I think they have basically three choices. Do they decide to vote for Donald Trump, kind of the populist, fiery, angry independents? Do they go for Bernie Sanders? over on the Democratic side, or John Kasich making a pretty direct plea as well. You know what's great when you said, I can't tell you how many people we've seen in the last three days here, who you say, who you voting for, an undeclared voter? Well, it's either Donald Trump or Bernie Sanders. It's either Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump. The common thread Anger. is amazing. Yeah, they're really it? just mad. They're just mad at everybody. They're mad at Washington. They're mad at Wall Street. Uh, they think all institutions have let them down, and they want to send a message. Uh, you did the first interview. You said this Sunday, right, with Trump after he announced? Right after he announced, yeah. And I've now done, a, I'm on 24, I think. Okay. <laughs> so uh, David Axelrod, I think, started a cottage industry a couple of weeks ago in the Sunday New York Times where he said, I was dismissive of this guy. I missed the whole thing. Did you miss it early on? There's a couple of things that I've been surprised by. Uh, number one, the, 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 how much he's been able to sustain that lead over time. I'm definitely surprised by that because remember, he started out and you had, I think it was something like almost 70, 67 percent of Republican voters who said they wouldn't consider him under any circumstances. That number is still pretty high, but it's nowhere near 67 percent right now. Number two, you know, I, I, I got to give the guy credit. Um, he's become a better candidate over the course of several months, learn how to modulate a little better. I, I do think he will, he, he could be in for an even tougher ride if he wins here and if it ends up um, in more of a two or three person race. But one of the other things he's been helped by, and who knows what's going to happen tonight, but one of the things he's been helped by is the fact that his opposition has been pretty fractured. Fractured, yeah. So let's go to the other side, which you know pretty well. As you mentioned before, you have, I think, the rare good fortune, I think, I assume you agree, having been inside campaigns and then cover gives you a perspective that is... I think so. I was a city councilor in Cambridge. Oh, okay, there you go, right? I, really, <laughs> I understand high-level uh, American <laughs> politics. When Bill Clinton did this thing where he essentially does an assault on uh, uh, on Bernie Sanders and the people who support Sanders the other day. To me, it sounded like 2008 Redux with, uh, you know, the, fa the fairy tale candidate in New Hampshire, then Jesse Jackson won in South Carolina, too. Am I overstating? A little bit. I mean, I, I, I think there's some of that uh, there um, because he was the first person to do it in their campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I think the nature of the critique he was making is a little bit different from the one he made against Barack Obama. It didn't quite have the, uh, the undertones uh, that, that the one against Obama had. Um, and I do think that he's picking up an argument that, you know, you talk to a lot of people, a lot of Democrats who say maybe it is time for Hillary to be making more of that argument. Could Wall Street end up being in 2016 for her what Iraq was in 2008? Not quite. I mean, I, th I think if you look back at 2008, um, I would say that was the single biggest strategic make a mistake the Clinton campaign had. It, by not apologizing for the vote on Iraq, she gave Barack Obama the opening, the, the, the policy opening he needed and th that allowed a lot of his other strengths uh, to come into play. Um, I, I, I don't think that this has, there's no single vote that you can point to, um, there's no single speech you can point to, no single policy. And I do think that Secretary Clinton at least has an argument, now there's a lot of disagreement over, at least has an argument as to the kind of reforms uh, she's putting forward and whether or not they're as tough as Bernie's. But there's no question that she's being saddled by not just the Wall Street, but the whole idea 
that she is part of the establishment, which rankles her, but you know, been around a long time, been first lady and senator, and that's clearly weighing against her. Yeah, but, but when you, you suggested that had she apologized quickly, it may have muted the criticism. I'm a huge believer that it's America's very forgiving. But there's no apology here either. It's in that answer the other night, which she seemed totally unprepared for when it came from Chuck Todd, uh, or, or, that's what they offered me. I mean, that's not only not an that was, apology. No, that was, that was, that was a bad answer. That was definitely a bad answer, no question. Speaking of Wall Street, okay. let's go uh, to her opponent for a second. Howard Dean was here the other day, and he told us, obviously, he's supporting Clinton. Howard Dean says the guy's not a coalition builder. He doesn't know how to get anything done. He's inspirational. He's all those things. I he think can't he get anything can't done. Change. I think so much of his um, power, and, and the, the reason he's done so well up until now, is that that speech he gave, he's been giving every single stop in the campaign is the same speech he's been given for the last 15 years. Going back even further, maybe 25 years, the issues change a little bit. The minute he starts to change on that, the more trouble uh, he's going to have. I think he's got to stick with what, what brought him to this point so far. The difficulty he's going to have is that, you know, the states coming up are quite different from sure. Iowa and New Hampshire. They're not as liberal, they're not as white, uh, there's more moderates in them, and that could pose more of a challenge to him. Okay, so if I had done this interview six months ago, and I said to you, okay, there's a democratic socialist that almost nobody ever heard of who's gonna be tied in the national polls, and there's gonna be a reality TV star, and a guy who is maybe the most hated man on Capitol Hill, Ted Cruz, who are going to be atop the two sets of polls. What would you have said to I would have thought by now, I think they'd be up there, but I thought others would have emerged in stronger positions than they are right now. You know, Bernie Sanders, I, I think for a long time, it's looked like a win in New Hampshire was very possible for him for a lot of different reasons, including the fact that he's a neighbor. In some ways, Donald Trump has the kind of message uh, that has worked for other insurgent candidates and the Republican Party in New Hampshire in the past as well, like Pat Buchanan. For sure. Uh, no question about that. So, you know, the fact that they can do pretty well here is not that much of a surprise. The fact that they've been able to su sustain such strength across the board, I think, is. George Stephanopoulos, it's great, it's great to Thank see you. you. Nice to see you. You can find that full interview online at greaterboston.org, and we'll hear a few more opinions on Hillary Clinton's Wall Street headaches and paychecks in just a few minutes. But first, a great politician once said the following, Iowa picks corn, New Hampshire picks presidents. The man who said that, former Governor John Sununu, joins me now. Nice to How see you, Governor. How are you, Jim? Good How to be you? here. You know, it's a great line, but it's not true. I went back and looked. 2008, McCain and Clinton. Did either of them become president? I'm not done. It was perfect till 88. McCain and Al it was perfect till 88. Then Clinton came along in 92. He came in second. Right. Your former, your boss, George H. W. Bush, and signed us one. Right. So you want to amend your statement? No, you because used to pick presidents. No, no, because we launch him out of here with momentum. You do? Yeah. Okay, fine. Projected winner on the GOP side. You're sitting, you're sitting down, correct? You called him. You said Trump has been a loser all of his life. Why do you call him a loser? And what does it say about the people in New Hampshire who are voting for the guy you think is a loser? What does it say? Look, I, I called him a loser because of, of his business failures, his four major resort bankruptcies. Uh, Trump Airline went bankrupt. Trump Mortgage went bank, bankrupt. Uh, Trump University not only went out of business, but the attorney general in New York called it a scam. Three Trump magazines out of business. Trump vodka, Trump, Trump ice, Trump fragrances. Okay, it. so you ask me why? There's a whole series of losers. Uh, I think there is a transition taking place about now, starting in New Hampshire, where, where voters are recognizing that 70, 75 percent of the voters are opposed to Trump. They're going to have to sort out who they're going to make the non-Trump candidate. I think the process started in New Hampshire. Three, four uh, additional ones will go down to South Carolina. They'll continue it. But what does it say about New Hampshireites who, assuming, even if he only gets 25 percent, if the polls are close to right, he's the winner at 8 or he 9 is. or 10 o'clock tonight. So he what does it say winner. about your state? It says that this state has, like the rest of the country, been participating in the election process to some extent on emotion rather than substance. And I think that transition has to take place and, and will take place as we send a, a much smaller group of credible candidates to South Carolina. Uh, you were not only governor, you were chief of staff to George H. Right. W. Bush. You supported him. You supported his son, George W. Right. Your son, the senator, supported the same people. He's now supporting Kasich. You have no candidate. Why are you not still with the Bushes? Because I think I have a better uh, capacity to contribute to what I mean I think is important cleaning this process out by staying 
neutral in the process and being able to comment over the next few weeks on, on the quality of the candidates and urge our folks to pick a good candidate to be the nominee. Do you still talk to your former boss? Oh, yeah. So when you talk to former President 41, Bush the elder, and you're not supporting his son, what, look at the smile on your face. What does he say to you? He's a gentleman. He never presses me. Is that really true? Yes. Do you feel, I mean, is there any, do you feel any guilt about the... Uh, not doing the I don't the feel thing? guilt, but it's certainly not an easy decision on my part. Okay, is, how do you think he's going to do tonight, by the way? I, I think he's got a good chance to be second or third. I, th I think there'll be two of the governors, Kasich and Bush, will do well tonight. Maybe Rubio will will hold a little bit of the momentum. Despite he had Saturday night. Despite then. Saturday night. And, and, and I think there'll be three of the four candidates to go out of here. You didn't endorse, as we just said. Who'd no. you vote for? One of the governors or former governor. Who'd you vote for? I'm not going to tell you. Why did you not say you're a public figure? Because I'm not going to. Why don't you spell the person's name backwards? How about that? <laughs> you know, I'm sure knowing you as I do for years, uh, even though some people would say we're different genetic species, but, but, but you probably hate identity politics. You're Cuban-American, which very right. few people know. You're two Cuban-Americans in this race. Look, there's two Cuban-Americans. A... There's, there's a, uh, uh, an African-American in the race for that. the Republicans. There's a woman in the race for the Republicans. This but the two very... Cuban Americans are senators. You're not even considering a senator. You just that didn't. I'm serious. No, I'm not, not I'm not playing identity. No, I'm not playing identity. I think identity politics is really one of the problems in America, not one of the strengths of the country. So long as you've gone your whole career without saying something bad about Barack Obama, I'm not going to let you do it. So do a little Nostradamus for me. The conventional, the polls, the polls, uh, in a real clear politics say double-digit wins for Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. Do you buy that's what's going to be the result it, tonight? It, it, you, are you talking about the polls or the no, I'm talking polls? About the, the, no, well, the uh, polls no. here have been closed, no. but the polling predicts 15, I think, 16. I think the margin will be less than the polls have been saying, but I don't know how much less. And I do think that the governors did well in the debate, and so a couple of the governors will be in that little cluster of second and third and move on to South Carolina. President Bush is on the phone, so you've got to go. Good That's to all see right. you. John Sununu, it's a pleasure. Thank Remember you. Remember the quiet man, great president. Great book, by the way. Uh, thank I you. Say. He's written a terrific book about Bush 41. Bernie Sanders has been criticizing Hillary Clinton for close ties to Wall Street. We've heard about the money she's bank giving speeches there. Earlier, I discussed this with Stephanopoulos. I also asked our caucus if she can dig out of that Wall Street hole. No, because she's 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 bought and paid for too much. She's she's in it, and and she has a long history of of uh, you know working with, receiving contributions from, uh, defending. Even though she says, you know, I went to Wall Street, I was the first to go to Wall Street and challenge them. Yeah, you did, but then you took checks from them uh, to speak before the organization. She has been in this bubble for 30, 40 years, of one bubble or another. Uh, and I don't know that she can do anything to get out of it. I mean, the idea that you know that you might run for president, that you're thinking of running for president, and you're accepting these gargantuan speaking fees, pump the brakes if you're running for president. I am generally puzzled. By, I'm both puzzled and interested by the following. Hillary Clinton is an intelligent woman, and she has answers to Bernie Sanders on these issues. It's not like Hillary Clinton doesn't know a fair amount about economic policy. If I were, you know, advising Hillary Clinton, I mean, to say what I think she really believes is, look, you're a democratic socialist, fine, I'm not a socialist. I'm a Bill Clinton-type Democrat. You know what, in the 90s we had pretty good economic performance. She is quite right that she did vote for uh, strong measures that reigned in Wall Street, or at least tried to. But look, one of the things that she uh, hasn't said that I think is actually worth saying is that she was the senator from New York. These are her constituents. And to a certain degree, you have to pay attention to the people you represent. Of course, Wall Street is part of the whole establishment argument against Clinton, and it's the two anti-establishment candidates leading here in New Hampshire. So although they're on opposite sides of the aisle, our caucus agrees, that's the main draw for both Trump and Sanders supporters. You can see the same level of anxiety about the present, about the fear of the immediate, immediate future economically. You can see in both crowds, the Sanders crowd and the Trump crowd, uh, a certain similarity and the way people are looking at issues and their, and their frustration over what is not happening. They are fed up with Washington, with inactivity in Washington, but it really goes beyond that, Jim. 
We're living through the equivalent of the Industrial Revolution. Here we are in Manchester, New Hampshire, a city that was completely formed by the Industrial Revolution. Mm -hmm. And um, we're going through the same thing now, where the entire economy is being shaken up and people have lost their moorings and they think somebody's to blame. Along comes a guy like Trump who says, you know what, I'm not even going to make those kinds of promises to you because I, I just not. I'm just going to tell you this is what I'm going to fight for. And there's an interesting connection, very much like with Bernie Sanders, where they get an authentic feeling from them. Uh, and the establishment types who've been making these promises for generations, they have no place to go. There is more discontent out there than the political class, and I guess I'm part of it, in Washington real has realized and the media elite has realized. And I sympathize with that discontent. The elites have screwed a lot of things up in the last 15, 20 years. Political elites, economic elites. Joy is what Bernie brings to the game. It's what Donald Trump brings to the game. Focus and joy. Bernie brings socialism, and it's not a bad word to the people voting for him. People come out of a Trump. I'm laughing at Trump. Everybody behind the scenes on television, we're always laughing because he's fun. Joy. I love that in politics. Again, you can see all of those interviews in full online at greaterboston.org. You know, before I arrived in New Hampshire a week ago, I told you why I thought it should not have the first in the nation primary. Too small, lack of racial diversity, no big cities. But considering its status is not going to change anytime soon, let's review. I met a pig for Sanders, tried to pet it, ran away. Only in primary season do pigs have business cards. Ted Danson of Cheers and Fargo and Hillary Clinton did not run away when I approached him at the place I spent most of my time, the breakfast buffet. The press, though there is a feeling that we're a little full of ourselves, there is a camaraderie here that is actually pretty healthy. The candidates, they do make themselves available. And since it's a small state, there's no excuse for a voter not getting up close and personal with any or all of them. Then the people, they vote. The Secretary of State here says turnout could reach 70 percent. Compare that with Iowa's embarrassing 16 percent and their even more embarrassing caucuses. And they do take it seriously. We have spoken to scores of voters who really know their candidates and their issues. So while I still would not pick New Hampshire to be first, as long as it is, they get it just about right. What do you think? Email us, tweet us, share your thoughts. One more thing before we go. I like to think we've done a few pretty good shows up here, but when I asked MSNBC's Chris Matthews to repeat something he'd said on his show, he refused, saying this. Tell me what you saw. And I've been on the air every night. Everybody knows what I say. Yeah, but maybe some people now. might have missed you at No, they didn't. No, they, they made a mistake and watched it. <laughs> okay. Now, if it is a mistake... I'm glad you made it. I hope you make the same mistake tomorrow. We'll be back in Boston with a full roundup of election results and a look ahead. Please join us tonight on GBH Radio 89.7. Marjorie Egan, Emily Rooney, and I will be live starting a half hour from right now. We'll bring you election results as they come in, check in with our reporters at the various campaigns, get analysis from some of the best in the business. It all starts at 8 and goes on till the last dog dies.